I arrived into the room, and only Nayota was present. I sat down on the floor and unrolled my sleeping bag. An exasperated sigh rolled from my lips, and I slumped onto my stable tech bedroll against the concrete floor. I lowered my head and took a long examination of the dim lit room. There were additional beds, one for all of our group. We honestly did not know if Jufunda was coming back here tonight. His state might have taken a turn we did not expect when we first arrived. None of us knew where corners had gotten off to, and Alagosil had just taken the chair backing, then vanished again. I suspected that Quickstitch was taking care of some medical business somewhere else as well. That just left the two of us, when something really started bothering me that Nyota had mentioned at the hospital when I had not been paying close attention. I, um... What did you mean by your tribe called you a demon? Nayota rolled over the bed. The springs groaning made a shiver crawl up my spine. What is wrong with beds again? Why haven't I slept on one willingly yet? He took a long, hard look at my face from its comfortable position. The simple question had caught him off guard, and he was searching for some ulterior motive to my question. He gave me a sad smile of resignation, finally, when he decided on the answer. <sighs> that is a long and boring story, Sunrise. But the short version is a bit more interesting. He slid up into a meditative position. The zebra sitting upright with four hooves out to his side and his rear legs crossed. Nyota took a deep, long breath before continuing. Would you like to hear it? He asked, sitting cross-legged with his eye closed as he took in a breath to relax. I sat up in the stable tech sleeping bag and pressed my back to the wall for support. After making sure we could see each other, I spoke. I'd like to hear the full story if that's okay. I like knowing more about my friends. I chewed the words as he opened his eye and I felt like some sensitive subject that should have stayed buried had been dragged out of the ashes. And you can always ask questions back. I added, hoping it would let his guard down. He nodded gently to me. Well, it will take a while, and we both need sleep, so I will speed things up a bit. He managed to tweak down the tension, one little racket at a time with each word. His words were doing more than offering exposition. They were being spoken in a way that was... soothing. First of all, the Starkateri, my ancestors, used forbidden magics and rituals. They called down the stars, raised the dead, and lay waste to those that opposed their rise to power. The other tribes stood united, and through years of war, eventually, our tribe was brought low. They were scattered to the winds to ensure we could never gain such powers again. He spoke continuously, without taking a break or either of us moving. Then the zebra turned his head, and took a look out of the window into the rest of the roof. 
I could see a few ponies passing by, but most had already gone off to bed. We are the unnamed, the outcast, the shunned, the thirteenth tribe marked for our hubris. We have a unique bond with the dark, death, and all negative emotions. I tilted my head in a bit of confusion at this. There were so many foreign concepts hitting home and I had to know. So just because of who your ancestors were and nothing you did means you get punished? Most care little for the squabbles of the tribes. But yes, most zebras would find me particularly unsettling, an ill omen or demon come to lay destruction, famine, or even death upon any pony nearby. He let out a chuckle and <laughs> shook his head as he turned back to me. When in actuality, we're just zebras with funny stripes. That sounds like a horrible thing to be told. So how do you deal with it? Have you been alone before you met us? I asked, getting up onto my hoofs and turning to face my friend on the bed. Physically, yes. Spiritually, though. He paused, and his gaze took me in. It felt like that look he gave me through his eye patch was piercing into my soul. My skin crawled a bit when his hoofs reached up to his face. Nayota removed a letter from his eye for just me to see in the dim light. I cut on the pitbuck light to give us a better look at each other. His milky jade-colored eye danced with the faint glimmers of starlight. It brought upon me a chill and a sense of wonder I hadn't felt since I woke up. It was like I could see the things Chifonda talked to looking back at me. We recognized each other's presence not in a physical way, but in the sense of two sentient creatures seeing each other for the first time. The gaze was alien and beautiful all at once. I am never alone. Nyota spoke, interrupting my staring. After a few blinks, I managed to take this all in. My lips were dry when I wanted to ask a question, so I held back for a bit, waiting to get the right question. What is that? I've never seen anything like it. I thought you were like Alguacil and were just more modest about it. It's a mark of my tribe's pact in blood. Nayota gave a grimace, as if expecting a blow that never came. I understood now why it felt like he could see through the eye patch. I moved, and that eye followed, just like his other one. My tribe gradually goes blind to the physical realm with age. Our sight is replaced with what dances beyond the veil. I cover it to prevent others from being unnerved, and to shield myself from the tortured souls that wander freely among the world when we destroyed it long ago. His honesty and openness shocked me for a bit. I realize now he only acted gruff to keep his distance. In fact, if we just asked, he was an open book. At least, to me he was. Furthermore, I could hear it in how he spoke and the fear in his voice. There were something about the mix of emotions. Sunrise, he isn't that old. He is barely older than you are. Pink was right. Nyota wasn't some old battered stallion. He was a young buck at his oldest. I stared into the eye for a while. I expected something to happen. Nothing jumped out at me, just the sense of wonder filled to the brim. There was no fear from it, no sense of dread, just wonder at a truly alien new concept that I wanted desperately to explore. I had to let him know. I fumbled with the words at first, and then found exactly what I should say. I... we... I, I mean... I can see how others might be unnerved, but I I, I... I don't think you should cover it when we're together, with just the six of us. I think it's a part of you that's quite beautiful to behold. I would, were it not for the souls wandering the ways. He offered his eyepatch to me. 
I refused and pushed it back to his grip. I found this in a box, not unlike those we received this morning. It blocks my sight of the spirit world and has been a boon to my sanity. If you wish it, I will remove it while we travel, but I'd rather not share this with the others. I rubbed the hoof behind my mane and felt a conflict rising up inside of me. Nyota was sharing something deeply connected to himself, far deeper than I suspected that he would ever share with any pony else. I suppose, if given the choice, I would rather not interact with that world. Given that so far it's been freaky, made me want to throw up, and generally felt just wrong. It's not about what I wish in this case. I thought you were doing it because you were afraid of what others would think. A bit of both, honestly. He said with a smirk. And as you've discovered why I prefer to cover my eye, I would like to discover why you prefer sleeping on the ground. Niora pointed a hoof at my sleeping bag on the floor. It seems odd that anyone would forego the comfort of a bed no matter the state of it, even more so when the bed is this clean. He gestured to the mattress he was sitting on and it certainly looked rather clean. They even had sheets on it that were soft and welcoming. I still felt a sense of foreboding towards the bed, from my experiences in the stable and before. Could you tell me why? My guard was lowered and I sunk my head towards the ground. I started to recall and then stopped myself. No, you are not going into a full memory right now. This is your friend opening up to you and freely speaking. Talk back and keep the memories at bay. Sunrise, deal with it later. He's waiting for you to reply. So reply already before I kick your flag. I will give Pink credit. She knows how to push my buttons. Earlier when I was remembering, in the stable, if you were sleeping on a bed, that was when they would do experimentation on you. If you were going into a stasis pod, it meant the release of memory orbs to keep you dreaming. And you didn't have to worry about waking up altered. I pressed the hoof onto the mattress. When a spring groaned, I winced and retreated back. The same kind of wincing I had done in front of Honey Heart's fire at Silver Fang Shanty. The same kind of winds that had induced a memory earlier that night. I don't feel safe on a bed. My last words were hollow and felt like some empty broken thing inside me that had been exposed. Would it be easier if you were held? Nyota reached out to touch my cheek lightly as he spoke. I looked into his face full of concern and worry, not sure if I should back away or press forward. Sleeping on the hard ground has been taking a toll on you, Sunrise. And if it helps, I will make sure you do not wake up altered. His words frightened me enough to stagger back. I stumbled and nearly fell over backwards with hoofs slipping on my sleeping bag. Alright, fine. If he's going to open up and be honest, I should too. Only fair, right? Friends should trust each other with sensitive things, right? The thoughts raced through me as I tried to piece together my combination of emotions, and my stomach feeling like butterflies were prancing through it. I don't think it would. My lips quivered, and I could feel the shaking of hooves into the floor. Not till I understand what they did. I mean... I didn't have a sentient tail when the door was sealed. I felt a weight and a piece of cold steel against my cheek. My tail was offering one of my canteens. One day I'll understand how you always know. I took a sip and my tail resealed the canteen on its own. That would have calmed me if I didn't get the feelings from my tail. I could feel it every nerve ending moment how it manipulated the bottle, and then tucked it away. I had no direct control over it. It made my skin crawl to feel my tail doing something, but not having direct control over it. I took a breath and continued describing the changes I had noticed. And my coat was white. I certainly didn't have some pink pony in my head, and I have no idea where I got all the information about explosives. <laughs> Nyota chuckled at me softly, 
and both of his hoofs moved to pull me back into a hug. He was forceful to get me close, then gentle. My head softly pressed into his chest while he held me. I do not mean to make light of your past, Sunrise. His slow, deliberate breathing calmed my nerves only a little. What I can say is that the knowledge you have has saved us all on more than one occasion. Even if it seems... strange? He released me from the hug and let me get back under my own weight, but I didn't move. Both of us found my forehoofs clinging to him and not wanting to let go. You are you, Sunrise, despite your physical differences between then and now. Niora pulled my head back, so I had to look up at him. And honestly, you're the reason I'm still here. There were some final words to that, like I couldn't be sure if he meant alive or with our companions. It was so strange to have a feeling that a friend might be alive because of me. Like having responsibility for a life and for happiness thrust on you, but a responsibility you've honored to take. I wasn't sure at first any of you would be someone I called friend. But in you I see a kindred spirit, someone raised on the ideals of friendship and harmony. Unlike me. He let out a soft sigh. <sighs> and it was like some sort of signal to release my hold on him. You still have hope that that way of life may come back. Yes, but I still got Buddy killed. My thoughts came rushing back about how I was responsible for leading them on our journey for some reason. Every step of the way had either been my suggestion or my fault. I feel responsible for all of you being here. And if Jafunda wants to stay because he likes Pike clean, I would be happy to know he was safe. I looked down at the floor and saw the dirt on my own hooves as something that might as well have been blood. It's only been three months since that way of life was lost to me. Neora let out an angry snort and wrapped me on the head, almost hard enough to bruise. You didn't get Buddy killed any more than the rest of us. He rushed into a situation without help instead of waiting for the rest of us. His hoof rubbed where he struck me to make sure it wasn't going to hurt for too long. And what happened is regrettable, but you cannot beat yourself up about the actions of others. As he spoke, he gave me another tree paps on the head before pulling me into a hug again. The squeaking of the bed springs made me flinch, trying to get away. This time though, Nayota held me tight and refused to let me squirm away. Friendship and joy are rare in the wasteland, and death is depressingly commonplace. Nayota sensed that I hadn't gotten more comfortable and released me. He made sure I was on all four hooves before continuing. I just hoped he couldn't see me shaking with the emotional turmoil. Before I met the rest of you, I spent my days traveling from place to place delivering packages and parcels before finding a bed and perhaps enjoying more adult pleasures. I held my hoof to my opposite leg and sheepishly looked away from his case. Yeah, except I panicked and ran for cover. Even after all of his fretting and taking the time to make sure I had good protection, I left him high and dry when I should have moved to help him. I stopped myself and felt the conflict inside of wanting to blame myself for admitting that Nyota was right. I couldn't determine what to make of all of the other information though. Nyota was quickly turning from a Rubik's Cube to a Rubik's Tetrahedron. At least I learned the lesson to help. Even if it means facing gunfire. My heart felt like it was dropping off a cliff before I could get the next words out. Even if it cost Buddy everything. And you can say sex around me. I babbed his chest to drive the point home. Goddesses only know what all memories are in my head from those orbs. My tail had pulled out the book and was prodding me with it. Finally, Nayota gave a smile, and then... He blushed when I wrapped his chest. Uh, right. Sex. He turns to look back out the window. You should probably take that book. Seems like something important. 
I took the book on their hoof from the tail and growled at it. <clears throat> I'm not quite done talking to Nayota yet, so back off. I know I need to finish reading the tactics section, but it can wait. For once, you are wrong, tail. My tail shrunk back at the mental beatdown it had just received, and it looked like I had wounded it. Yes! My tail gave an emotional expression at me. Did you want to get some sleep? Or is something else on your mind? I prodded while setting the book onto the floor. No, I'll keep an eye on you while you sleep tonight. I... I don't know. He returned to look at me with his normal eye now, but his expression was more thoughtful than examining. I guess I just... He started, before trailing off, and for the first time ever, I saw Nyota's confounded expression. He was tongue-tied. I'll listen. I haven't got a whole lot better to do at this hour. I offered, while sliding the book out of sight into my sleeping bag. My tail started to protest, until my eyes shot at a look that could kill. Have you ever wanted something you know you cannot have? He asked hesitantly. I've been a filly till I woke up. I'd say 80% of the time anything I wanted I got told no to. So I would say yes. Intimately. Why? I mused for him to continue. Uh, I suppose that's close. He said and reached into his bag at the edge of the bed. He pulled out a small box and then a picture still in its frame. Neoda offered the picture to me and I took it. The Oasis. My home is gone, and even if we remove the Legion from it, the Legion will come back. The picture showed two zebras that looked very similar to him. His parents? They looked so much like him, down to the odd-turned and curled stripes. I could clearly recognize the much younger Nyota smiling happily, all while they posed for the picture and held Nyota. His head was cutely nuzzled into his mother's chest for the portrait, and the other zebras in the background were clean. The area around them was lush, green, and very much like the idyllic wish you were here sort of image. I would even call it a post-it card for a family that couldn't make it for a visit, like something straight out of the time before I went into the stables. I turned up to him and smirked with an idea. Then we stop the Legion. For good. We find out what those coordinates are. Why we ended up in that hole. What Stable 43 did to me and where my parents are. Then we can stop the Legion for good. I spoke with certainty that these were our clear objectives and that I had set my mind to it. Nyota looked at me with a new expression. Like I had grown a second and third head? Then he burst out laughing and reached out for another one-hoofed hug while uncontrollably cackling. <laughs> sure. He said through his deep chuckles. We'll just get our ragtag group together and face down an entire army. He was tearing up through the laughter for the lack of taking a breath. <laughs> Walk right up to the Kaiser and tell him to stop being a meanie, because we should be better than our ancestors. <laughs> he slapped my back with his hoof and had to steady himself from rolling off the bed. I struggled to get away. All my wiggling to no avail. Even when I started tapping the shoulder of the zebra to let me go. I mean it. Look, we're already going all over Equestria to get into what are apparently secret stables while in the process of rescuing a pony-napped Pegasus. Nyota started to calm his laughter and looked at me, trying to take me seriously. <laughs> then I'm going to ask you all to come with me to Stalingrad, where Stable 43 is, right next to the border where the Zebra Equestrian Wars front line was. I paused. As I finally got him to realize I wasn't joking. I was dead serious about all of it. It isn't like we can't go a few more days travel, free Oasis, and face down Caesar. I gave the most determined, my mind is made up. Look, I could. What was I getting myself into? Sunny. He stopped himself when he saw the glare. Sunrise, it's not that simple. The Kaisar, and by extension the rest of the Legion, 
wants nothing more than the eradication of everyone that isn't Legion. Pony? Dead. Griffin? Dead. Anyone that isn't already Legion? Dead. They're about as reasonable as a Hydra, and much more dangerous. Nyota, I'm sure by the time we reach them, we can do something to change that part of the world. If you're willing to follow me, then I should help you. How can I say no? I waited to see if he had an answer, then continued speaking on my position. You're all following me right now, and I don't know if you will accompany me all the way to Stalingrad or Stable 43. If it comes to that, we'll cross each bridge when we get to it, right? I was trembling from head to tail. The thought of going back to Stable 43, the feeling of threat, the memories I kept suppressed from that terrible place, that slowly reviving. All of it wanted to come flooding back, and I pushed it aside with a bite of my lip to force pain to keep me thinking about something else. My eyes closed, and I turned my head away from Leora. My entire body expected a blow that never came. Only soft words. I'd much rather find a quiet home and a mare to love. Maybe start a new oasis after exacting my revenge on the ponies of the Legion that raised my home. He stopped, and I could tell he sensed my distress as I opened one eye to look at him. Are... are you okay, Sunrise? My defenses crashed down, and I laid my head into his chest. Even if my back gave an uncomfortable shiver at the sound of the bed springs. The prospect of having to return to Stable 43 scares me. Terrifies me, even. I'm hoping we can go do anything else to locate what happened to my family before I consider we may have to go there. I hesitated to speak further, and then glanced at my stable barding before looking to my stable tech sleeping bag with a up. Noxious 43 across the front. I wear the barding because it smells of my father, and the sleeping bag has my mom's scent. But the place... I couldn't bring myself to finish the sentence. I could feel the memories wanting to come forward, but refused to let them. <clears throat> right now, though, my friends are the closest thing to family I have. You'll have friends with you. I spoke with an honesty that rang me free from fears and shakes just listening to it. His words were not just honey, but a genuine article of care. Care I missed from before the stables. You won't have to do it alone, so don't let it bother you so much. And if you need someone to talk to, I'm always willing to listen. I leaped at him and hugged his neck tightly. I didn't dare speak above a whisper while I clung to his neck with all my strength. A part of me feels my parents are dead or something terrible has happened to them. I'm glad I'll at least have friends like you if that's the case. And you remind me, there is still a hope, no matter how slim. He reached up and gently stroked the red half of my mane. Well, one way or another, you'll have some closure. He was patting my back to signal me to let go. Apparently tonight is the night of hugs. And I'm glad that you're not going to call me dad or something. That would make things awkward. You know, you started off as cold as Alguacil. Instead, you've been the warmest, nicest pony underneath all that layer of coldness. Why don't you relax and act that way around the others? I put my forehooves onto the bed. Part of me wanted to climb up there and relax on the soft sheets. I froze like a leaf in the winter, the moment the springs creaked under my weight. I couldn't bring myself to get up there, or move away. Because I generally don't like any pony. You grew up like I did. He pointed at me, then at the rest of the room, like one of these things didn't belong. But like I said, you still have hope that the world can get better. I've seen most of the world. I am jaded. I accepted that I couldn't change things. But you've brought that hope back. And you're cute. 
He finished speaking and then turned a bright pink. Pinker than Chifondo's stripes. I was taken aback and tilted my head sideways. My thoughts lost in confusion as I stared at the zebra trying to understand. Slowly, I pieced it together and suddenly felt deeply insulted and rage began to build up inside me. Cute. <laughs> you know what? I wanted to hit him. I was cute? Cute like a little filly who thinks she can take on the world? Fine. I darted down and threw my sleeping bag onto the bed. The clatter of the book tossed into the wooden wall shook his blush away. I wiggled free of my barding and took a moment to notice the very distinctive lines where the barding had been and where my coat had been exposed to the elements. There were several shades of green on me now. You could tell which layer of clothing had been protecting where. I moved back to the bed and put both hoofs up on the bed before the sound of the springs froze me in place again. Uh, did... did I say something wrong? Nyota took the time to remove the sleeping bag that had landed on him to the bed properly. S- sunrise His words were hesitant, and his expression was thoughtfully trying to figure it out. No, you're right. I grew up. I slept in the bed. I didn't wear armor when I slept or, for that matter, for weeks on end. I told my legs to move, but they wouldn't budge. It was like my body was protesting against my conscious mind. I should be willing to sleep in a bed. In my sleeping bag. Next to a friend. The force in my voice was a stark contrast to the struggle to make progress onto the bed. Otherwise, I'm just cute. A cute idea. That's... that's not what I meant, Sunrise. Nyota shoved the hoof onto my bare shoulders, and everything stopped. The feeling of another pony against my shoulder without the bargaining separating us was so alien now. I meant cute, like... He trails off and sigh. <sighs> Look, I'm sorry that you took what I said the wrong way. I didn't mean to upset you. I turned my head to the much brighter, less dirty part of my body he was touching. Then back to his gaze, I could see the hurt in his eyes, and I stopped my struggles. My rage deflated, and suddenly, I felt like I was in the wrong. Then what did you mean? And you didn't upset me. You proved your point from the start. If I can't do this, I can't get into that secret stable. I can't save hot cross buns. I can't figure out what stable tech did to me or how to undo it. I, I can't... I swear at this point, I know this place so intimately. It's basically my breakfast. I meant you're cute physically, and I wasn't trying to prove a point, I was just curious. His case was someone clearly giving the same look that Pickline gave Chifondo when she first saw him. I could feel the burning blush pushing into my cheeks. I'm attempting to crawl into bed with a stallion who isn't my father who thinks I'm cute. This couldn't possibly be more awkward, could it? Oh, Sunrise, you don't know the half of it! If I told you my story, Pink wasn't going to be allowed to finish her sentence. I'm here to help you. I'm sure the others are too. I would have followed you regardless, but you're also a cute mare. So, yeah. Nayota replied rather bashfully, and I was surprised to see him looking away, then stealing a glance with his eye while blushing. I think you're cute in that way. Stunned at this revelation, I collapsed under my own weight onto the bed. All my efforts now deflated completely. I... I... I've never had someone refer to me as cute as anything other than a filly. I chewed my lip against the mattress for a bit, and a playful thought was loaned to me by Pink. If the Ministry of Morale caught me even being friends with a zebra, I'd be shipped off to a friendship camp. I rolled my eyes at him. I'd be deported if I was found dating a zebra. Go on, Sunrise, take the chin! Get out of that bed! I am! Give me a minute to find the right words, you little pink plate monster inside my head! But they don't exist anymore. Help me up. He blinked repeatedly at the statement and requested. After a tense moment, 
Nyota grabbed my hoofs and helped me forward. Yeah, well, if I were alive back then, I would have been shipped off to a friendship camp, so we never would have met. Every single creak of a spring made me hesitant again, till Nyota got me up onto my sleeping bag and set me down on my own weight. His words, though, kept my hooves from retreating back. I'm glad I woke up in that pool, you know? Finally, I settled in and continued to roll the joke for comfort. You're right, and that would be a shame. I'll need some time to think about what you said, but we'll talk about it when the rest of our friends can't walk in on us at any moment. I slid into the staple tech sleeping sleeve, then curled myself into Neota as close as the winter-sized fabric would allow. Neota, for his part, was very careful with me. One leg supported my head while another wrapped around my shoulders. He was very gentle, and took his time to make sure every piece was placed in the most gentle, cold fashion possible. It was like he was threading a minefield. Well, I probably wouldn't have said anything, but I don't like seeing you angry. He replied once we had gotten still. I don't know. Last time was pretty great. I broke Corner's nose and she stopped acting up so much. There is a sigh. Nyota, can I ask one thing? He simply nodded against my head, waiting for me to speak. Can we train in the morning? Huff to huff? I'd like to be more capable than this next time I need to box some pony in the nose. He gave another sheepish nod, and I listened to his words as best as I could, as the world around us faded away and I could feel an extra blanket land over us. Rage with purpose is a useful tool. Rage without purpose is the flame that consumes. Good night, Sonny. I look forward to training with you as well. Zero days till Mega Spell Day. We had been called to the stable in the early morning. This didn't feel like a drill. It was just as Celestia had begun to raise the sun. Stable 43 had nearly 200 ponies waiting to get inside. Everyone had foals my age or younger, without a cutie mark, and we were walking into the stables as quickly as possible. We could see various mares and stallions in white lab coats, with the Staple Tech logo on their right breast as well as their backs. They had clipboards asking us all questions and checking of citizens as they got to the huge gear-shaped sable door. Inside, my father took a Staple Tech jumpsuit and got himself into it. His wings had to get out of the special slit cut for a Pegasus. Then he turned and helped me into one. By the time we were done, I had been rubbed with his cologne he had put on before the drill was called. Mom's deep blue fur contrasted well against the obnoxious stable tech screaming blue. She almost looked black furred with his jumpsuit on. She flicked her white and orange mane aside with a grin. That smile didn't last long though, as she got beyond the outer doors. This drill was upsetting every pony going in. There were two lines just past the outer doors. One full of foals and one for her parents. Both led deeper into the stable, but the foals were not happy about being separated from their parents. Mares were protesting and stallions looked like they had been taught lessons by Stable Tech security. Shadow Window was stopped by Stable Tech Mare and her voice sent a chill down my spine. I know that voice, but it can't be. Hello there. The requirement is that foals be separated just in case they have been exposed to radiation. They are much more vulnerable to it than their adult parents. This mare explained to my mother, and I knew that was. It wasn't a voice I would ever welcome. Mom was having a none of it. She wrapped two deep blue hooves around my white neck and pulled me in tight. That shouldn't be necessary. This is just a drill, isn't it? Rainbow Eyes stepped past us and started to speak when two security officers, one unicorn stallion and one unicorn mare, both stepped up. I couldn't make out much behind their riot helmet and heavy plate armor. He looked at the two of them. Both had solid black clubs floating in the air along 
with 10 millimeter pistols on their side. Now look here. No need to threaten with violence. We just don't see any. The lab technician waved a hoof in front of him to silence him. Mr. Rainbow Rise, you will fully understand that as a part of this- She was interrupted by a rumble in the distance. A flash washed over us and everybody turned their attention back to the city. I looked past my mother, past the line of families wanting to get inside, all the way towards Stalingrad. Way in the distance, beyond the base of the mountains, at the river, a mushroom cloud was slowly rising from the city as a giant red shield slowly enveloped the entire city. It all started happening so fast from there. Hooves of the lab tech grabbed me and something about them, the way they were cut and manicured, caused me to realize this wasn't the first time they had touched me. Agent number nine? No. This can't be. Her voice. Her hooves. <laughs> I froze in fear, and she tugged on me to get my mother to let go. But Shadow Window would not relent. Stable tech riot guards ran past us to stop the impending rush into the stable while a loudspeaker kicked up. All stable residents, keep orderly. Form a line with falls on the right, dots on the left. The faster you do this, the faster we can get you inside. Shadow Rise looked fearful as the two security ponies pushed him aside, while Ancient Nine and Shadow Window had a tug of war over me. Listen here, Shadow Window. Regardless of what you think, I must keep to regulations. She went as far as to strike my mother on the nose. You will see Wandering Sunrise on the other side of decontamination. Now let go before I have security make you let go. I could see my father fighting to get them to let him go. My mother desperately gripping to hold on as the pony was proven stronger than my unicorn mother. Then mom launched herself forward and into the lab tech and bumped her off me completely. With space between the two mirrors, she held me tight and all I could do was shiver in terror. Ancient Nine clapped her hooves and security guards began to approach us as she grinned. That smile could only be described as bone chilling. Hold on. Look, let me say a few words to Sunrise, and then we can go into the separate decontamination areas, all right? Her horn glowed as she spoke, and a magical shield appeared between us, and the guards stopped. The orange glow film encircled the world beyond, and the guards looked to Agent Nine for instructions. She motioned a hoof at them to back off. You have ten seconds. Agent Nine told my mother. Shadow Window hurriedly hugged me and kissed my forehead. She held on to my shoulders tightly, and the warmth of her smile put some of my fears to bay. My father flapped his wings in hopes of gaining some traction, and Agent Nine turned her attention to him at the sound. She used a hoof to motion to let him go. Rainbow Eyes blitzed through the air and over to us and hugged me tightly as I looked very confused. Please, don't let me go with her. She's... It, it's all right, Sunrise. We'll see you soon. On the next sunrise, at the least. No, we promise. While her words tried to soothe me, my father wrapped his wings around my body to hug me from an odd angle. I just stared at Ancient Nine out of one eye. She stared back. There was an amount of anger going between us. But her smile? Her smile sent goofballs down my spine. That's enough. Other families are waiting, and more mega spells are likely to go off soon. Ancient Nine told my mother, who held on to me protectively as long as she could. As soon as I was out of her hooves, Rainbow Rice rushed forward to guard me. The security ponies were having none of it and immediately pressed the black batons against his chest and held him back. I walked sorrowfully away, tears falling from my eyes to the concrete floor. I looked back as my parents went into their decontamination room and could see the flashes of explosions miles away. The mushroom clouds rising from the city we called home up to the sky, all against the backdrop of a sunrise. On that very day, I learned what that meant by a sad sunrise. 
I turned to what was in front of me. And that was a bright white decontamination light blasting my face. Back to the waking world. Level progress. 22% of the way to level 6. Yes, we're back to getting there little by little. Back to those who are in need. The 